Yeah, welcome to the session. We also have with us Mr. Surya Mohapatra, Global Head, Talent Transformation and Learning and Development at Wipro. Surya is engaged in evolving strategies for career development, talent and knowledge management for the organization in India. He speaks regularly at various national and international forums on topics related to HR, learning and development, corporate culture and spirituality. His articles have been published in various journals and magazines. We welcome you, Surya. And then we have Mr. Pedder Jacobson, Vice President, Learning at BI Worldwide. Pedder works closely with learning strategy directors and client executives across the globe to help organizations maximize the impact of learning on the business outcomes. We welcome all the speakers and we welcome each and every participant and audience and delegate who have joined us for this session. What would be your advice? What would be kind of what you see as the, let's call it the critical components of delivering virtual and digital learning when you have to reach beyond your borders? You know, what have, what have you found? What advice can you give us all? Yeah, I think I would uh, speak from my experience um, as the global leader for Wipro Digital Operations and Platforms Group. Uh, I think there are six building blocks, six critical components. The first one is the learning vision. The, the vision that you have, you know, what, what's your learning vision? What do you want to accomplish? The why that you talked about, not just for the people, but also for the organization. I think that's the right. Strategy. Right. Uh, the second one is your, your strategy. What strategy you want to put in place? When uh, you were talking about the new world, uh, it's a global organization. So what's going to be your learning strategy? Uh, are you going to have learning journeys? You're going to have standalone programs. You're going to have blended uh, learning strategy. I think the most, the, another important thing is the learning strategy that you have. The third aspect uh, is technology. Uh, what technology you're going to use? What platforms, what tools? Um, you know, how do you make sure that learning happens? So I think the tools, technology, platforms, this is the third important component that I can think of. The fourth one is um, your l &D organization, the readiness of the l &D function. Facilitation in the virtual world is not a lift and shift as a club is. Right. So right. it's a different ball game altogether. Right. So we all agree how, on that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so how do you really get your your facilitators, your trainers, your instructors ready to uh, be effective in this new format. I think that's another important block. Getting your l &D function prepared, you know, making them ready, equipping them with the, with the tools and the skills to be able to uh, lead training in the new world. Uh, the next one is experience. Because today, um, learning is not just about meeting business outcomes. Changing behavior is also about the learning experience. In the new world, we are not just developers or creators of content. We are also designers of learner experience. Right. That's another important building block, as I see. And the last one, in my opinion, is culture. In a glo global organization like ours, it's the diversity. Uh, the workforce is spread across multiple countries. Then we have diverse, the gender diversity, the cultural diversity, the geographical diversity. Uh, how do you really cater to a diverse audience? How do you really include them in your learning strategy? So these are the six components, six building blocks um, of learning uh, for a global organization like ours. And that, that would be my two cents, which I would like to... Well, I am I, I am just amazed at 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 your the experience and leadership that you both have because you have both shared an awful lot of meat for 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 me to kind of chew on. I guess not being a vegetarian, maybe I shouldn't have used that as an example. <laughs> I guess that's a U.S. centric saying, maybe. But you, there's an there's an awful lot of good content there 
for for us as 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 leader learning leaders ourselves to chew on from each of you thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on those things and at this point i think we have about um uh, just another 15 minutes left uh, uh, left yes. in the session so um thank you for the fireside chat to clavia and Syria. i look forward to continuing our friendship as uh, as as we move past the session mm -hmm. Um, I think we're taking uh, questions, questions that have yes. been from the audience at this point now, correct? Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Peter. And thanks a lot, Ekalavi and Surya. Just stay tuned because we have quite a few questions. I hope we can do justice to uh, most of them. Uh, one definite, uh, not really a question, but a request that has come in from a couple of um, the, our delegates as well is to you, Peter to share the case study on the, the compliance bit. So please do feel to share that to all, with all the audience. Everyone is keen to um, see how it has translated into effective learning. Uh, the second question, again, it's not, uh, it's not um, for a particular speaker. Anyone uh, could uh, answer that is, the question is employees consume learning in different ways. And how do you manage to do that? How do you assess the learner types and how do you go about creating a personalized L&D design to be cost effective? So I think quite a few questions, but basically, how are you trying to manage content and learning elements designed for specific learner styles? I think that's what the audience wanted to check on. Anyone, please. Surya or Clavia, do you want to, either of you want to take that on to start with, or do you want to let me go ahead and dive in first? I can start and then you can add to it, uh, Peter. Um, all right. So a couple of things. I do, it is a very long question. I don't think I've captured yeah. all that. <laughs> we can spend an hour on this one. <laughs> I think very specifically what they wanted to ask is that how do you go about designing contextual or specific learning elements as well as content for different learner styles that are there within your organization? Yeah, that's a challenging one. So I would, I would say that, you know, the path I would take is I would create an ecosystem where uh, our learners can come and create their own pasta. Yeah. So, uh, personalization of learning because of the diversity that we see in, in our learner population in, in the workforce, you know, they have different learning styles. Each one has a different learning style, you know, and then it's, it's difficult to cater to um, all the learning styles. Of course, we will have to cater to our programs will have to cater to, uh, different learning styles when we have a group of learners in a program. Uh, but I think I'm really thinking ahead of our times and then I'm talking about personalization. So can we create, create an ecosystem where uh, people can come in and then make their own pasta? So you, 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 you provide for everything. You provide different types of pastas. You provide different sauces. You provide different uh, spices. Let them come and then you know, make their own pasta or let them choose their pasta. And I think that's, that's, that's extremely important in an organization where, uh, which is very dynamic, the needs are very diverse, uh, the learner styles are very, very diverse. Personalization is the way forward. Technology can be a very important player there. Technology can make that happen. Today there are very powerful, powerful learning management systems which can actually make that possible. So I think as learning practitioners, if we can build that ecosystem and then facilitate that, and sometimes not just um, you know cater to uh, personalize a personalized needs, but we can also invite them to cook their pasta. You will come over and then cook it yourself. Uh, so that's what I would like to share, and then Peter and Nicholas may want to add something to that. Nicolavia, hey, anything Peter, to add to that? Ahead. Yeah. Okay, got it. All right. Um, you know, I'm going to say something, um, I, I think, which um, um, the, the, the person who asked the question may actually consider to be heresy. But if you look at, at some of what went around 20 years ago in terms of adapting, adaptive learning and adaptive to learning styles, and you dig beneath the data, what you find out is there's nothing there. Yeah. And, and, and so um, what I would encourage you to do is go the direction that Surya went with this and less about adaptive learning and more about personalized learning. Um, and so there's a lot you can do from a digital standpoint to ensure that you're delivering, like I said, with the digital learning um, considerations of, of, of the language, of the content, 
of the brand um, and of the device. And, and, and I like um, what you said about making sure that it was optimized for the device because we're big believers in not just shrinking or stacking or stretching, you know, depending on whether you start on the laptop and you go to the mobile and you start on the mobile and you go to the laptop, but how do you optimize that experience on both and still do it from a single version of the course? That's the key. That's the Holy grail. So that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, but it's a, I think it's an important observation. So I'd encourage you to look at that. And then when you, when you look at that personalization, what you realize is that I am personalizing based on what business unit I'm from within my corporation. I'm personalizing where I'm in geographically. I'm personalizing culturally by language and maybe for context. I'm personalizing by role because what role I play within each of those things all, all maps to how do I personalize that content. Um, and then I would say that, that the, the other thing that's absolutely critical in, in kind of personalization of the content is the path through the learning. And that tends to be role-based. And so it's not something that you can easily create a detailed learning path for your entire organization. It tends to be by role. So one of the things we did for one of our clients in, in, in the U.S., which is a U.S.-centric client, is we in, invited those in the role to participate in helping define what that path is and lighting the way, saying this was my my journey down the path. And here's what the end looks like. And here are things that you can do to learn more about this to find if you want to actually go down this path. Because one of the things I would say when you're talking about the personalized paths, that was a part of that question of the personalized you know, journey through the learning, is that tends to be role-based. And so it can be really, really um, um, intensive, manually intensive work to try and define that for all the roles in your organization. And they constantly change. So it's a big thing to chew off. What I find is organizations are finding, here's a critical role for us. We have a shortage of these people, or this is going to be critical to how we're going to expand moving forward. And that's where they spend the time on those personalized paths. Yeah. I'm so happy, Pedro, that you cleared the air on this uh, learning style bit, you know, which was very popular right. a few years back, you know, right. the visual auditory and kinesthetic or whatever. Right. You know? The research data does not support those learning styles. So I right. really uh, like the direction in which Surya took this and personalizing based on roles is, is the way to go. All this talk of pasta is making everyone hungry, Surya. <laughs> <laughs> and that, thanks a lot. And I, that kind of answers up, I, at least two of the questions from two of the delegates who also spoke about how important it is for organizations to create their own learning content. I mean, allowing the employees. And even before the question came in, you guys kind of answered that. So that's great. Uh, the next question, um, quite a few questions, but uh, yes. Uh, the next question is on any comments on the computer competency learning strategy um, using learning pools very clearly tied to competencies where employees can choose what they need to grow on. And of course, some suggestions, again, it's again related to personalization, but I guess they wanted to hear a little bit more on how you can run a competency-based uh, L&D strategy. I think that's the question. Any thoughts? Anybody want to take that? I, I can start. Uh, and I'll let each of you, um, um, obviously, when we're thinking about no feel and do, we're talking about a competency and skill level at some at, at some level. Right. You're talking about what is the gap between what our people know now versus what they need to know? How do they feel? How, what do they need to be able to do? So we're big believers in that. What we've seen is that, that across the broadest areas of the organization, there are existing competency models and there are existing libraries of content that you can tap into. And, and then what we've seen is our most effective clients turn that uh, uh, competency modeling into their critical roles and there they dive deeper and they may modify that that pre-existing co um, competency model um, whether it's a three level or five level model it, it, it almost it's less important the application and implementation of it's less important the model in my in, in my opinion the, the individual model that you choose but you personalize that and then you end up looking at saying okay for my critical roles the roles that are going to make the biggest difference to my business moving forward for my organization moving forward to what has been assigned to to me um, to do, then let's take a look at, at personalizing that because there's no way you can maintain that for the entire organization. Um, and once we define that, then what we tend to do is say, okay, our high performers, what are, what's, what are they no feeling and doing different than our mediocre or even average performers? Now you've defined a gap. 
And now if you train to that gap, you can move a large portion of your audience, if you do it well, up into the, that competency level of your high performance. I would, I, would, I would say that's where I would start. The other thing, it's buried in the, the question itself, was a whole idea of, of, of treating learners as adults, which I really like, you know, or, um, and that is to give them enough room to be able to manage their own learning. Um, at, at a certain level as well. And so when we've actually created competency pads, we give enough room for our learners to be able to learn, not just prescribe each individual thing down to the last little iota. Sure. Surya or Claudia? Anything from your end? Uh, thanks. I think just we'll move on to the next question, given the paucity of time. The next question, um, I mean, Iklavia, Iklavia, you come in from, an, uh, from a very specific kind of an industry. And of course, Surya, you come in from a more of a global uh, setup. Um, the next question, of course, uh, is on the end outcomes. How do you go about measuring it? <laughs> so the specific question that came in from the audience was that, what are some of the better ways of measuring learning impact and outcome? Even so, when the commonly used metrics haven't changed much, which is your enrollments, completion, satisfaction levels. So I think, how is it that you, you can, and now this is what I'm adding on. So how is it that you can go higher up the Kirkpatrick levels of evaluation and not just stay at the behavioral, all the learning phase? So Ekulavya and Surya, so, anyone, anyone? You know, that has been the holy grail for the l &D <laughs> professionals. And, and I wish I had a better <laughs> answer than what I'm going to give. But let me just say how we have measured the effectiveness yeah. of digital learning in our case, right? So we've obviously looked at, you know, the usage and, and adoption rates and so on, right? Those, that, those numbers come directly from the system directly. Uh, you also look at, you know, feedback from people. And, and I think everyone does do the level one, you know, um, sure. measurement, right? So you, you have the pre-scores, you have the post-scores, right. and, and you also can figure out whether some knowledge acquisition has happened or not. So level two is also you know, relatively easy to do, you know, uh, in the digital learning world. Uh, level three is, is, is what we sort of, is where you need to have discussions with the business leaders and see how those behaviors are getting applied in real world, right? Do we do that for everything? No, we don't. You know, obviously for some of our critical learning, we do that. And, 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 I, and I remember uh, both, Surya started with l &D, uh, you know, vision as the first thing, you know, in, in his six critical parameters. And, and I think even Pedro talked about, uh, the business uh, strategy is a, is, a, is a starting point for all of this, right? So, you know, uh, the question that we start all our learning interventions with is what is, a, what is a problem we are trying to solve, you know? And I make sure that, you know, all our interventions start with that, answer that question. What is the problem we are trying to solve? And has this intervention solved that problem, right? So that is, that is as far as we go. You know, is it only numerical? No, you know, there is a, there's a space for stories, there's space for anecdotes, there's space for qualitative input as well, so that you have a, a overall a blended uh, story here. Uh, but do we go all the way to ROI and so on? No, we don't, you know, and, and that would be my honest answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, so, the next, yeah, yes, yeah, sorry, so, Surya, you had something to add on, please. Yeah, I know we're running out of time, but on a lighter note, I think when you go to a temple or a church or a mosque, do you ask yourself, what is the ROI? <laughs> you don't ask them. Why do you ask when you, when you go through a learning intervention? On a serious note, I think Eklavya has said it. So my question to the, to the gentleman or the, or the lady who has asked this question is, before we talk about measurements, my question is, have you defined the objectives of your program, the learning yeah, program? Absolutely. Have you defined your outcomes? If you have defined, then it's as simple as going back and then measuring whether those objectives have been met or not. I would add one secret, and that is that sometimes you want to measure the ROI and you want to measure even a strong correlation to your business outcomes, but you don't have the resources. You're constrained in your organization by resources. So I have a secret for you. There's a little known study that came out in 2001 that showed that if you ask this question in your level one survey, it's a better predictor of, of business outcomes than even some of the level three stuff. And that one question is, it was the training relevant to my job? Yeah. And, and so that's the secret question in level one that can actually, if you're resource constrained, you can't do that. Make sure you ask that question. And then as you're developing your learning, make sure you're asking the question, is the training that I'm developing relevant to the jobs of the people that will take the training? So that's the, the kind of a, a secret kind of cheap way of, of getting at some, some higher level uh, measurement. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, beautiful analogies. Um, the next question again is 
we're not able to hear you they do um, we are facing okay. challenge in our so i'm sorry Couldn't you can't tell me oh yeah. sorry i think the next question was on how do you actually help your uh, audience or the participants uh, how, how exactly do your trainers connect with your audience or the participants and ensure that the the connection is pretty uh, robust and that the ice breaking also is done perfectly so the specific question was um, how do trainers connect to their audience especially in a virtual setup I defer to Klavia and Surya uh, on this one. Surya, you want to start, and then I can. Yeah, I can start. So, um, yeah, in the virtual setup, it's more challenging. Uh, in a physical classroom training, the in, the facilitator is the face in the crowd, or she is standing before the audience. In the virtual platform, you are one of the fifty windows on your computer. So that's a big challenge. so uh, i think in the interest of time the very short and sweet answer to that would be how do you engage with your learners with emotions can you really strike that emotional chord with with the learners i will bring back that why question that peda brought about at the beginning if you can really establish that establish that and then ignite that that why in the participants i think engagement is established so it's obviously challenging uh, to match the same level of engagement that you will have in a classroom right you know so uh, the uh, the suggestion i give is that you know if you can get 80% of that that's good enough you know what you need to do is to be passionate about the topic that you are you know passion always shows even through a virtual medium right and and conversations people love to have conversations you know uh, virtually or physically right so make it conversational look at the camera you know those are the some tactical uh, you know suggestions for sure right uh, and 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 you know always good to have multiple trainers because you know like like what we are having today you can make it a you can turn a training into a conversation and then you you are able to engage the learners better sorry absolutely thanks thanks a lot uh, each one of you for joining us in the session we are dot at 501 a lot more questions that have come in but uh, unfortunately because we need to adhere to our timings uh, i'm sure we will try to answer each of these questions offline and those were all the insights that we have gathered and a lot more to come our way from our eminent speakers um creating contextual learning elements for your uh, employees in your organizational context i think is the key to success for any learning strategy that was my key takeaway and of course the personalization bit um so stay tuned and even for the rest of the four sessions that are coming up in this direct to digital series uh starting from today uh, and they are going to end on 20th of october uh, along the lines of recognition framework for the hybrid workforce the rewards and performance engagement through the lens of the virtual nudges and leveraging hr technology to accelerate digital transformation so those are the next four sessions that are coming up uh, in our way and uh, thanks a lot to pedar eklavya and surya Thank for you. joining us in this honor. session it was an honor yeah, it was an honor for us as well and uh, to hear from you uh, some of the live case studies from each one of you and also some of the great you know uh, fun analogies as well which made a lot of sense surya <laughs> to be really frank yeah. so thanks a lot and uh, to end the session i think uh, i'm sure all of you would agree with me is that every adversity opens up for newer opportunities to achieve a transformation that can change the course of the future and that's the stage that we are in right now even more than ever before um and the same thing would apply even for our learning as well to ensure that learning is always continuous for ourselves and even for our employees i think on that note have a great day ahead and thank you once again for joining us for this session thank you thank you so much thank you thank, have a great you. day ahead thanks everyone for joining us thank you